Welcome to the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Bello. Today, I've got Mitch Steven on the show. Mitch, welcome. How are you doing, Chris? Doing well, doing well. It's great to have you here. Love the energy. Great question. <laughs> so who is Mitch yeah. Steven? Go ahead and introduce yourself for us. Uh, my name is Mitch Steven. I've bought a house about every four to five days in or about my hometown of San Antonio, Texas for over two decades. So, you know, if you do the math, it's about 100 houses a year for over 20 years. Uh, that and seven bucks will get you a really expensive cup of coffee down at one of those expensive uh, coffee shops. But that's what I know about. That's what I'm good at. That's what I do. My higher reason in life, there are at least two in business, is one is to help winners become owners. I specialize in a strategy where I buy houses with other people's money, and then I sell or finance those houses to buyers who could not qualify for dr traditional loans, and they just make their payments to me, and yours truly is the bank when I collect the mortgage payment. I move these would-be renters out of, uh, out of renters and into home ownership. And then my second passion from my podcasts and all that is to help people find out where they belong. I, I help people find their financial independence, even at the most modest means, like 3000 a month, 4000 a month, whatever it takes to quit your job so that you can free up 2,600 hours a year to figure out what you're really supposed to be doing in this planet and who you're really supposed to be and, and what your real passions are and have time to become a real expert in the things that matter to you. That's so. a very powerful meaning and why. And I love that that second part, particularly just to enable people to quit their jobs and have the time. Because when you put it that way, you, you say all the hours that we're spending it many times in a job that we're not passionate about just to pay the bills, you don't really get to open up to what your true purpose is. You don't get to ask those deeper questions. So I really love uh, that that mission statement or, or your why for your business and, and your podcast. Yeah, I got to have a higher reason. You know, at first we all start out because we need we need to make some money. Yeah. But it won't take you long to figure out that after X amount of money, money's not really helping you anymore. It's not, I mean, you're, you're not going to drive a, a better car. You're not going to live in a bigger house. You're not going to do whatever. At least, I mean, some people go on and on and on and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then obviously they implode, <laughs> they, yeah, they implode and it's a big nasty mess. And, you know, they have documentaries on their fall, you know, the rise and fall of so-and-so. Um, me, mine's just going to, my documentary is just going to be the rise of Mitch Steven. And then you just stay right there. <laughs> <laughs> no fall. You know, yeah. <laughs> stay right there. No falling. You know, it's just, I was down here and I got to wherever it was. I don't, a lot of people might've went higher, but like I, but, but they, but I'm coming down, you know? So that's, that's the thing. You just don't want to come down because I've heard it before that, all it takes is one home run. It just takes one home run to become successful. You just have to be right once. But of course, you don't want to have that fall afterwards because if you kind of get all the success just to lose it all, that's probably worse than never having had it, I would imagine, you know, because you had the taste of it. And we see a lot of those types of stories. And so, yeah, the lottery winners are a classic. Oh, yes. They didn't, they didn't earn it, you know, per se. I mean, you know, and, and they don't know how to keep it. And they right. live really high for a few years. And then it's a devastating blow because, it's all eventually taken away from them or lost. The money and management lost. piece, that's something that people have to get disciplined no matter what level they're at, because otherwise they'll just find a way to, to spend it or lose it. That's one reason why I'm so happy. I have had no silver spoon in my mouth. I did not come from a family of money. I had to earn everything I had. There was no gift in my story, a monetary gift. I had lots of gifts. Uh, my family, my father, my mother, my brothers, you know, I had, a, I had lots of gifts, but no financial um, windfall, no financial gifts. I had to make it all myself. And I'm really, really glad that it took me as long as it did to get where I'm going, because I really understand what it takes to get there. And I know how you lose it. And I know what not to do, because <laughs> I earned every little tiny step along the way. You know, I fought for that ground and then I, I'd have to give up two feet and then I fight back and get four feet. And then I have to give up a foot and then I'd fight back and get another three or four feet. And I crawled all the, all the way to the top of the mountain that I'm at, you know, and I'm under no illusions. There's right across the street somewhere, someone who's bigger, faster, made more and could probably use my financial 
um, statements uh, to to wipe their back end. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. But, um, but there's a lot of people who would like to be where I'm at. So I have relative. a hand down trying to help those people up. But then I also hired coaches and mentors that are way beyond me. And I got, I got my other hand reaching up, trying to go to the next level for me because there's always another level. I mean, you know, Chris, there's always another level. It doesn't matter where you are. 100%. And I love what you said there of reaching up. You're reaching up to mentors that are further ahead, but you're also making sure to pull others up with you. It's just a journey of self-development that I think we're all on. And just like you mentioned, there may be someone else who has more money than you can use your financial statements as totally There paper. always is. There, there always, always is. is. But on the other hand, we always like to compare to those who have way more than us. But like you said, there are several people who would love to be where you are now. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that we are in a very good position. I actually wrote out all these different gratitude things this morning um, on my whiteboard because it's so easy to forget all the things that we have that we should be grateful for, but we often take those for granted. So very, yeah, very important I, distinction I, there. I found myself very somber and very, um, I don't get depressed, but in like a funk through, or something. Somber, yeah. getting into my funk. And I thought, you know, what is there to be, what is there to be unhappy about? I'm, I'm the luckiest man on the planet. There's millions upon millions upon millions of people that would like to be in my shoes on this, on this globe. And to get centered real fast, you still go back and start being grateful, start thinking about what you're grateful for. And that list just like never stops when I start reciting it. I can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, but still sometimes funk hits, you know, it's and it's funny how it happens. Right? It, it, it hits me about twice a year. And I have learned to recognize it. And usually what I need to do during that time is go home, don't talk to anybody, don't confront anybody, don't go to the office because I happen to be, I happen to radiate whatever it is I'm going on. If I walk into the office in a downstate, the whole office will collapse. You know what I mean? Yeah. So and I need to contagious. I have to stay away. I have to stay home. I just really what I need to do is go to sleep for about 10 hours. I just go to sleep. <laughs> I wake up the next day. It's like it never happened. I'm off again. And it'll be another six or seven months before for some reason it revisits me again. It's important there that you said you've learned to recognize it. That's something a lot of people don't recognize. They just keep going and they're not sure. They just burn out because they think maybe working harder or working through it will get them over whatever that is. And so recognizing it for yourself and knowing you need to stay home and just sleep for 10 hours and then reset, it, it's probably a little bit different for all of us. Maybe even just disconnecting, getting out into nature, taking four days to go to the beach, something like that, and then being able to come back. So that's that's yeah. what I've been doing for myself is getting out in nature, just disconnecting. It seems to help when I don't have signal and no one can call me and yell at me for different things. <laughs> that always helps me out. That was one of the things I did very poorly. Um, today I'm 60 years old. Um, I started burning the candle at both ends, you know, from the minute uh, I got a car or whatever, 15, 16, you know, I mean, I always had my school, my athletics, and then I had my little business or whatever my endeavor was. And there was always not enough time. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been very, very poor at balance. And I'm finally getting balance in my life. I'm 60 years old now. I wish, you know, when I talk to my partner, my partner, one of my partners and my main partners is Mike Powell. He's 33 years old. He called me the other day. He said, all right, so what's on the agenda for 2020? You know, this was earlier in the year. And I said, I mean, 2021, I said, I said, well, here's my plan for you. You need to make it to the gym at least four days a week. And you need to take at least four vacations, one a quarter of at least seven days. <laughs> and that's what my wish is for this whole company and everything is that you find some damn balance because it, when you go down, this whole company suffers. I said, I don't have any right to say this because when I was your age, I didn't do a very good job, but I didn't have anyone over me pointing it out to me or actually going to put their foot down and I'm putting my foot down. You're going to take vacations and you are going to take your time off. And I'm going to prove to you that this damn world's going to do just fine without your ass for seven days, every quarter. <laughs> it's funny how that happens. And it takes some practice because we think everything's going to fall apart if we step away for that long. And I love that you are pushing that to your employees and requiring that they take that time off to regenerate and just restore that energy. Because when they bring their best A game, the whole company will do well. 
And if they don't, of course, the whole company will suffer. Yeah. And I told him, I says, let's make it an experiment. If the company is really having a hard time because you're gone for seven days, then something's broken. Something's yes. wrong. When we come back, we need to fix that so that never happens again. Right. You and know? building your business in a way that allows for that to happen is something that I, I stress to many people as well. Because if you create a trap for yourself, you can create a, a job, basically, even in your business that was supposed to be this escape turns into this job that you just can't get away from. Because when you stop working, the money stops. And so getting getting it to a point where it operates without you, it, it can hurt the ego a little bit because you don't feel as special. But that's when you really can grow and scale. Um, I, it took me 15 years to do it. Um, like I said, my business partner now, he's already enjoying a lot of it. But I haven't seen the last 400 people that bought my houses and I haven't seen the last 400 houses that I bought. And I can honestly, unless someone hands me a spreadsheet, I can't even tell you where they are in my town. But I own 300 houses in my town. Or I'm collecting 300 mortgages on houses. I don't know where they're at. Uh, I could find them. You know what I mean? I yeah. Could out, I'm going to find them in a New York second. But I, I, I could be driving right past five or six of them tomorrow when I you drive right now. I don't even know. <laughs> That's incredible. So how one time, one time I did say there's a house I need to buy that house, you know, because it was like it looked like a vacant house. You already somebody, owned it. <laughs> I already owned it. I was like trying to buy a house and I figured out I well, let's look up the owner. It was me. I was like, wow, well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And I'm sure it's it's come a long way from when you first bought that first house. So I mean, can you talk a little bit about when you first bought your first rental property? Were you working at another job? Were you nervous about it? Obviously, you're buying property side unseen now. Your team's doing it for you, so you've come a long way. Well, I learned not to buy rent houses because I want to. I want to sell or finance my houses, but I did start out the buy and hold. You know, I had gotten 25 houses one at a time. Um, they were all home or all owner occupied FHA loans. Every single one of them, you know, owner occupied. I uh-huh. like, like, what are they going to do? Take away my vast riches? You know, if they catch me. <laughs> you know, I don't have anything to lose. So I just kept applying, you know, people go, that's against the law. I said, yeah, I know, but you know, I don't suppose they're going to really do, do anything <laughs> as long as I pay them, you know, I got to pay them. Right. Yeah. Right. So anyways, I bought 25 houses. I was supposed to make $300 a house between what I owed and what I collected. And so that was like $7,500 a month, which not even I was dumb enough to believe that all $7,500 would go in my pocket. So I only needed $3,500 to quit my job. So when I got to $7,500, I thought, okay, that's good enough. I quit my job. And then I found out that I wasn't still making any money because the tenants were just eating up those liabilities of being a landlord were just eating up everything in between. Mm -hmm. You know, renters move in, tear down and move out. Uh, I needed to get out of that and I didn't know how to get out of it. So I paid my last $10,000 in 1995 or six to a guy named Rick Olson. And um, he was going to show me how to fix my problem. And he made me promise that when I showed him that it wasn't going to be bulky, it wasn't going to take a lot of time, four or five days. I mean, he wasn't going to be able to tell me anymore and that would be the end of it. And either I would do it or I wouldn't do it, but it was an answer to the problem. I said, well, if what you tell me works and I pay you 10 grand, I mean, how much of that 7,500 will I expect to make every month? He says, I've looked at it and you should make this whole 7,500 every month net. Hmm. So I said, 10,000, 7,500 a month. Okay, I'm in. It's good return. Yeah, it was not, you know, like if it works, it's going to work in spades, right? You know, like yeah. it's not even a problem. I have my money back in a month and a half. Uh, if it doesn't work, then I'm out 10 grand and I'm broke now. Yep. Uh, and he showed me how to sell or finance those 25 houses. You know, go at the time, those houses were around 35, 40,000. I was collecting an average of 3,000 down a house. I sold all those houses in about six months with 3,000 down, say average per house. I had 75,000 in the bank, which was more money than I'd ever seen in my life. And the $7,500 a month was coming in in the form of a mortgage, which meant I wasn't responsible for anything, which meant I was netting 7,500 a month. And people, and the phone call stopped. Like no one called me for an air conditioner or a hot water heater. You know why? Because it wasn't mine. Because it's their problem now, right? Yeah, and I, I fell in love with the whole thing. And and 
you know, I've, I've bought about 100 houses a year and I seller finance about 70% of them. Now, the problem with notes, the problem with the seller finance strategy is, is it's going to run out, right? You know, an apartment complex goes on forever because right. you're renting. You got rental houses, it goes on forever because you're renting it. You got a note, they're going to pay you off on some point, probably sooner than later. I mean, even 30-year notes, they only average being like seven and a half years in America. Maybe at the economic echelon that I deal in, maybe those notes last 10 or 11 you know, years, you know, because mm-hmm. the People I'm involved with are flawed, but my people don't go refinance. What happens is they they get a realtor, they list the house, and a new buyer comes with a new loan, and that's when the payoff call comes. Okay, okay. My buyers are never going to refinance. They wouldn't have they wouldn't have sell our finance for me in the first place if they were the kind of person who could get a new loan. Right, because they've got some kind flawed. of issues or credit. Yeah, they're inherently credit. flawed. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just saying. A lot of them are good people that have bad things happen. Uh, right. Then the other people are just other people that just don't care to focus on what a traditional lender or a bank requires of them. They don't care, you know, or, or they, you know, a lot of my people are coming from other parts of the country where the banks were horrible. They never kept money in the banks. You know, they didn't trust banks. Yeah. Interesting. So they don't even have a bank account and they keep their money on them you know, or, Mm -hmm. or around them somewhere. So, so that's when I started seller financing. And um, so the, the flaw is you have to take the money you make from one-time cash events, like fix and flips or wholesales or temporary cash events, like seller financing, where I get some cash up front and then I got an income stream for 10, 15 years or whatever. I have to take the money I make from all that. I have to buy into a forever form of cash flow. Being something you rent, although I hate being a landlord, for houses and for living quarters. But I don't mind being a landlord for boat storage, mini storage storage, facilities. So I went into storage and I am CanyonLakeStorage.com. I have 14 facilities around the lake where I live and I have 1,300 doors. And those 1,300 people owe me an average of 100 bucks a month. What's the math there? How many you said? How many doors? 1,300 times $100 a month. So hundred, it's one hundred and thirty thousand. That's amazing, and and they actually pay. Plus, you don't have to kick them out or anything like that. They don't pay me. The resistance over that ten by ten square that's full of crap is way lower than if you're trying to move you a family out of the out. home out into the rain. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So There's you would just point, auction but, it out at that point, and then you could rent it out to somebody else. Yeah, but I'm just saying the resistance. People don't fight for that crap as much as they fight when you're trying to move them out of some place they're laying their head every night. Right, right. You know, school districts, children, jobs, uh, proximity to grandma and daycare and all this. When you start to move someone out of a house, there could be a whole bunch, a whole different size of fight. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I, I know a lot of people that are starting to get more into the storage rentals because that very reason, they're just tired of the tenants and it's harder to kick somebody out who refuses to leave than to just change the locks on a storage unit. Yeah, I know. And, and not to take it to extremes, but then I, then I have found myself in predicaments where, you know, the lady's a 92-year-old lady. It's all she's got. I mean, That's she can't make payment yeah. anymore. I mean, what am I going to do? Well, with a 92-year-old lady, am I going to put her on a street? She doesn't know. I can't find anybody that she has or anyone's going to take care of her. Like, what do you do? Right. I don't want to be in those positions anymore. The problem is I have a heart. Yeah, that that's tough. Because I mean, what do you, I, I know a lot of people have a heart as well. You can't just kick grandma out on the street to fend for herself. And most, some people probably do. No, as, some people you know, can, a lot of people can. Yeah. But I mean, at a certain point, it, it just gets more difficult to do. And so I do have a question on the seller financing thing. Because I mean, I am in, in the real estate space. I have not done any creative financing type stuff, but I have some experience wholesaling um, properties, but whenever the, if the person stops paying or once they pay it off, I assume you just have to continue that process of acquiring new properties to continue that since there is an end to it. Yeah. I mean, when they pay you off, maybe they live there for four or five years, they get a job transfer, they need a bigger house now, or they see a house they want. So they put the house up for sale. I get a call. Well, I get a lump sum, you know, I, I'm getting a big hefty check because, you know, I bought it for 50 I sold okay, it to them okay. for a hundred with ten thousand down. 
I, they owe me 90, but it's been a couple of years. So they still owe me like 87. So you get that I payment. Still owe about 50. So I'm getting 37,000 drops on me. Right. I need to go buy another house. It's kind of an endless thing until you buy enough storage units that you never have to buy another house again. And you got the money coming in from the storage units, you know, or whatever your forever your cash, cash flow. Plan. Yeah. Your forever cash plan. I like that. I like that forever cash plan because the the seller financing, you said, I mean, there is an end to it, but it's, it provides those lump sum opportunities when you sell and the down payments and everything like that. And then you can go into a forever cash type of investment and that could be anything. I mean, for you, it's public storage units. Yeah. Yeah. Private storage units. Yeah. So, so. Or private storage units. So here's the thing, you know, like in this book, my life in a thousand houses, the art of owner financing, uh, I talk about why I picked that strategy over the buy and hold. I'm not talking, you know, a lot of people have been made wealthy through rent houses. I'm not saying right, but it's a completely unfounded idea because it's not, it has a, it has a place, but it's different. And, and they're not, they haven't always told us the truth about all the trouble that it is or what you're really making when you rent a house. I mean, you know, you may only be making eight or 9% on your money, which by that case, you'd be better off if you just gave it to me because I'm going to pay that much and you won't have to do a damn thing. Um, <laughs> no have, toilets way, or I have, anything. I have $26 million of private lenders uh, out on the street. So like, today's the first, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm writing a checks to pay people their payments on $26 million somewhere at my office right now today. There's a, there, Somewhere there's a thing running out of ink because I'm printing a bunch of checks to people to pay. So I buy the houses with other people's money. I buy the houses at 50, 60 cents on the dollar. I give my lender a first lien. I never borrow more than 65% of what I can sell or finance the house for. I determined what I can sell or finance the house for based on the rents because I want to make the PITI payment the same as the rent in the neighborhood. So I use the rents. I back into a formula that tells me what I can sell the house for and still uh, offer these renters a house payment that's equal to what they were paying rent, P-I-T-I. And so I have 300 mortgages on and off. It's really hard to get more than 300 mortgages. I'm trying to get the 500, but every time I get up there, people pay me off and I fall back down. So I have 300 mortgages and I average $500 per month positive cash flow times 300 mortgages. How much is that a month, Chris? 500 <laughs> times $500 profit times 300 houses is 150,000 a month. Wow. Positive, positive cash flow. It's awesome. And I probably collected a million or over a million dollars in down payments to create that cash flow. That's why I like this business so much cuz I have some money today from the down payments. Like I'm averaging, you know, 100 houses a year, I'm averaging about 8 8 houses a month. If I only get $10,000 down per house, that's $80,000 a month in down payments. That's my money. Okay? You think you can live off of $80,000 a month in down payments? I think I could find a way. <laughs> you can't even really spend it all, you know? Yeah, There's that's plenty, right. 40% for taxes, right? And then you got to, then you still can't spend it. So you're rolling it back into your business all the time. Which right. is how what you're supposed to do in a real business situation, right? Is leave as much of it in for as long as you can, right? Roll the money back and roll it back. And instead of building a skyscraper really tall so that when the winds of fortune blow, it could t- topple over, you keep rolling your money back in. So you keep expanding your foundation. So you build your business like a pyramid. You know, those pyramids in Egypt, they ain't blowing over. Absolutely not. Right. They will not blow over. So that's what I like about the seller finance strategy. You know, the only thing I don't get from seller financing is is appreciation and depreciation. But here's how I handle it. You know, I bought a house for 50 and sold it for 100 in less than 30 days. Like how much appreciation do you damn landlords want? That's that's plenty, yeah. (laughs) You want to annualize that crap? Come on. You don't even have enough numbers on your calculator, probably. (laughs) Number two depreciation. No, I bought the house. I'm averaging four days on the market. So I don't have any depreciation, you know, but it doesn't take that many of them. And I'm buying a a million or $2 million storage. And now I got some depreciation storage. You know what I mean? You get it on the back end when you invest in the, in the facilities. Yeah. With what I'm buying with the money that I'm not getting depreciation on. 
Right. So, you know, every game, every game has its way to win. So some of people say, well, do I get a C Corp or do I get an S Corp or do I get an LLC? It says, it doesn't really matter. Pick one and win. You know what I mean? Learn the rules and win. You know, so same thing with these hmm. strategies. Learn the rules and win. They're I all, love that. All these strategies are good if you're good at them. I'm writing that one down. Learn the rules and win because every game has a way to win. There's just different rules you have to play by depending on what you're what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, well, should I do this or should I do that? I said, no, it really it depends on you and in your market and what you feel is best for you. But whatever it is, pick a game, then stay focused on it until you just till you're Tiger Woods, man. I mean, you can beat it every day, you know. Maybe yeah. that was a bad example, but you know what I mean. Hundred <laughs> percent. So learn the rules and win. How did you go about learning the rules? I know you said you you invested your last ten thousand dollars. That was the thing that changed everything for you and and shifted you into the strategy. It was an accident. I did it out of desperation. I didn't know what okay. to do. I had all these people that I didn't want. I couldn't sell the houses in the neighborhoods that I'd bought these houses because no one wanted to live there, mm-hmm. and no one who wanted to live there could get a loan. That was for sure. Right. You know. So I was, at, you know, I was at the bottom in the hood, you know, kind of messing around because I thought in my mind process at the time that since I didn't have any money, I had to deal in really cheap stuff, which was completely wrong. You know, I thought I had to do it with my money or bank money. That was completely wrong. I just learned these things as I went, as I went to seminars and webinars and talked to private lenders and talked to people who were bigger and better than me, get them to change my um, limiting beliefs. You know, like the guy who taught me this strategy, you know, he he took me down. He put me in his truck when he was going to deliver his IRS payment to the IRS for the year. You know, Mm -hmm. he showed it to me before he dropped it in the mailbox and I saw it drop in the mailbox. It was proof positive. I mean, the man paid seven hundred thousand dollars in tax, income tax. That was all the proof you needed. (laughs) you know, I don't, I don't even need but a fraction of that problem. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'll be fine. But his theory works. Obviously, I saw it. Um, you know, my doubts about those infomercials that late night TV and everything started to subdue. I went back and opened up and took the cellophane off some things that I had bought that I really wasn't convinced were really going to work because I thought they were scams or I thought, you know, mine was... Carlton Sheets and Nothing Down by Robert Allen and all those guys. And and once I became a believer, I started studying those things with all my heart. And they worked. I mean, they, they the strategies work. People ask me all the time, like What's they the want secret? me to coach, they want me to coach them on seller finance. I says, does it really work? I said, look, I know it works. It's worked for me with gangbusters. And I got students all over the nation that it's worked for. So it's not a question of it's worked. The question is, do you, will you learn how to work it? Right. Because the theory works. You know, let's just get past two things. One is, you know, are you smart enough to understand it? Do you have, the, like, actually the capability, which, you know, the answer is usually yes. And two, are you motivated enough to do something about it? Because, and maybe one other thing, maybe there are some markets where my particular strategy or a lot of strategies don't work in every market. You know what I mean? Yep. So I need to look at the market and go, where do you want to do this? You know, well, I want to do this in, you know, California. It ain't going to work in California. You know, my house <laughs> is $700,000 for the house I'm buying down here used to buy for $20,000 that I have to buy for $80,000 now mm-hmm. is $700,000 over there. It doesn't work in that kind of house. Right. Totally different market, different numbers. Yeah, yeah. So you might have to either move to Georgia or learn how to set up shop in Georgia. You know what I mean? Remotely. Yeah. So you can, you can do those things out of state as well. Well, it's a little more challenging as you might imagine, you know, than if you're there, but if you learn how to do a strategy from afar, you actually have a real business now, one that you work on instead of in. That's the problem with a lot of us that we get stuck in our businesses is because it's too easy for us to go down and pick up the trash or mow the yard or to do whatever. It's too easy. Right. And we don't and we, and apparently we lack the mental discipline not to let ourselves do it. So we find ourselves down there with hammers and saws and doing bullshit when 
You can you just know, pay somebody else to do it or find the right person. You could person. have paid someone else 12 bucks an hour. Instead, you're out there sweating your ass off yeah. on Labor Day weekend for 12 bucks an hour when you should have been taking the day off because Tuesday is the foreclosure day and you need to be out there trying to find a house that you can make 50000 on, not save 15 20 bucks. Yeah. 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 That's a mindset that so many people are stuck in just uh, feeling like if I can do it, why would I pay someone else to do it? Right. It's so easy to do. But it's difficult to delegate those things out at times. So you're, you're so right. I want everyone listening to play it back and listen to that part again. You should not be the one going down there, swinging the hammers, doing the $12 an hour tasks. Find someone to do that and work on your business instead of in it all the time. Yeah, I'd say find a house, figure out how many hours it took you to get it all consummated all the way to the end. Mm-hmm. Take whatever amount of money you made and divide it by the hours and start landing on what your what your hourly worth is and anything under that you have to delegate it's it. you have to sub it out you do not work below your pay grade so you you have a calculation of some sort de- depending on the deals do you actually track this for all I mean, your when deals? I was younger I did because I because I wanted to know mostly I wanted to know because I had to fight my wife all the time you know hey you need to mow the lawn I ain't mowing the lawn oh you're too good to mow the lawn now you know I'm worth 800 bucks an hour Right. You know, find someone else to mow the damn yard. Unless you want to pay me, you know, six hundred bucks. bucks <laughs> and you need to find someone else. Because I, if I, I mow, mow it, I'm cutting you're cutting me a check for sixteen hundred bucks. Right. Because you your know? time could be better spent finding more deals and in, in making those larger commission checks. Or or yeah, that's how rational rations. people think. All it got me was a couple of nights on the sofa. <laughs> But if you have the numbers of the calculations, it helps yeah, a lot it. more, right? But you know what? They have the controlling factors, okay? So Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, that that's very helpful though, because I'm I'm in that same thing now of like, oh, you know, I'm I'm gonna invest this money and just pay eleven dollars per plate for this meal prep food because I don't want to be cooking and cleaning and doing dishes. I want to be out there doing more deals. No, no, makes perfect sense. And you know, some people would say, Oh, you're 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 hoity doity. You're, you're too good for this now. He says, no, it's not that. I'm too smart to do it anymore. I've done. I I, I smartened up. I you're focusing on your supposed, zone of genius too. Yeah, what are you I'm actually good be, at? I'm not supposed to be a lawn guy. If I'm supposed to be a lawn guy, I'd have a lawn maintenance business, and I have a whole bunch of people mowing lawns. But exactly. No. You know, my wife would say, Mitch, can you stop by the cleaners and pick up the dry cleaning? I said, Tommy, you know, I, I, I'm I'm worth eight hundred dollars an hour. Can you find someone else to pick up the dry cleaning? Really. Right. And I wasn't very popular, but after a while it started to catch on and people quit asking me to do shit like that. Yes. And it's a different mindset though, because so many people are stuck. I mean, I remember hearing, oh, Jeff Bezos does his own dishes. I think someone told me that at some point. And this was years ago. I'm sure he doesn't do any of that anymore. Just his net worth oh, is so astronomical. If something's cathartic for you, like me driving my tractor around my ranch with a 15 foot bat wing shredder, mowing my senderos so that my ranch looks like a golf course. That's work, but it's somehow cathartic. It, you know, I, I get there. It's, it's like playing Pac-Man or something. You know, you go down yeah. the road, you go up the road. You go <laughs> the road you know, I mean, I mean, it's cathartic. And you could throw so a podcast on that. there, have some quiet time, probably a little more peaceful. Yeah. I got my air conditioned cab. I got my stereo on, you know, you know, playing the latest country songs. And I'm just out there in my tractor <laughs> cowboy hat jamming away, you know? Absolutely. There, there it is. The cowboy hat. <laughs> I love it. It's so finding that thing for you. I mean, if it feels like a, a release or a little bit of a break, then yes. But if it drains you, if you don't want to do a push lawnmower and, and mow your, your lawn in hundred degree weather, that's something that definitely needs to be outsourced. I love that. Yeah. If you want to do it because you need to put in the workout, you need to drop the calories, good, go do it. If you hate it, then why are you Don't doing do it? it? Yeah. You know? So what would your what would your advice be for someone who maybe has not bought that first rental property? I know a lot of people are doing the FHA thing, house hacking. Um, any suggestions on how someone can get into the investment space? I mean, I really love the seller financing thing. Sounds like the way to go. Well, so look, when you don't have any money and when we're broke, like we all started out broke. Did you start with a big bag of money? I did not. No, I couldn't. I, you know, I didn't have two nickels. I bought my first houses on credit cards because I didn't have any money. I had good credit and I had credit cards and houses were only eight or nine or $10,000. So I could do it. But, um, but when you're broke, you're really a professional deal finder. You're, uh, you, you focus on 
finding deals and writing them up. You're, fe- you're a professional deal finder, writer upper. Is that the <laughs> word? You're a deal finder, writer upper. Because yep. that contract that you get signed is worth money to someone. Right. You know, and that's how you work yourself out of a hole. That's how you get out of the 15 an hour gig is by after your 15 hour dollar an hour gigs over at five o'clock in the afternoon, you go to work where you make $10,000, you know, uh, 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 for a deal or, or, you know, a thousand dollars an hour. You know what I mean? Absolutely. That's where the money's made is in finding the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Finding the deal and knowing how to write it up in such a way that you have as many advantages to help you proliferate to, p- to proliferate as possible. You know, it's a lot to that. There's, you know, take a contract writing course or something specific from a wholesaler or something, because there's clauses and things to put in and you got to buy yourself time and you got to have the right, you know, to show the property to other buyers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But learn how it works. You know, what did we say? Learn the rules of the frigging game and win, you know, and, and when you choose that game, then block everything else out. If nothing else, that that is like the summary of today's episode, because no matter what you decide to do, which strategy, uh, whatever, what was that term that you use? Passive income, like forever income? Forever, forever, forever cash. Forever cash. I love that. So whatever you learn or decide to do, learn the rules and actually implement it, because it may be different for everyone listening. You might want to wholesale. You might want to be a real estate agent. You might not even be in real estate at all. And that's totally fine. But whatever it is that you choose, learn the rules and actually and then get around the winners get it, too. Get as much free as you can from the internet and then make sure it's for you. And once you're sure it's for you, then only stick on that subject and go as deep as you can for free on the internet. But when you hit the bottom and you're not getting any more really something good, then you should probably know who's teaching that, that's doing that the best. And that's when you hire the mentor to shortcut all the crap. And, and to keep you from mind screwing yourself and to get you over your limiting beliefs. That's so I mean, powerful. When I was trying to teach someone the other day, they said, you know, well, about getting private, I said, you need to go out and find some private money. He says, why? You know, the reason why they didn't think they could find private money was because they were too young. They were 24 years old. They didn't even own their own house. They said, why are these people that have money going to loan me money? I said, you know, it has nothing to do with you. Uh, Charles Manson should have been able to get this money from prison. You know, you're going to pledge a $200,000 house for a $100,000 loan. And if you don't pay them the $100,000, they are going to get a $200,000 house. Who gives a crap about you? Right. You know, so once we broke that barrier of limiting belief for that kid, you know, he's like, wow, it really shouldn't matter, should it? And I said, not only shouldn't it, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> I'm telling you, it doesn't matter because I'll give you a hundred grand right now for a $200,000 house. I don't even care what you look like. I'm going to go investigate the house. I'm going to make it really worth 200,000. That's, That's awesome. what I'm going to investigate. I could care less about it. As a matter of fact, I hope you fail. I hope you're stupid, crooked, lying. I hope you're everything. Because then you I get the house. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's the best thing because it's not investing in a startup idea. You have a, a physical asset that that person has a lean position on, right? So if anything happens, they're the first person to get that house. And for some period of time, at least there's evidence that this house is worth that. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. Unless the whole world goes to hell in a handbasket or something. Yeah, and, and other evidence shows that a house should be worth more every day through most cycles. I mean, there's cycles, but you know. Right. So yeah, yeah. So So that's the thing is a coach can help you through some of your limiting belief. If he's a decent coach, he should be able to squash a lot of those excuses you're having because you, you can't, you can't rationalize how it's done. So you need to talk to someone who's been there and has gotten through it. Then they'll explain to you, hopefully in a way that washes your limiting beliefs away. Definitely. And hopefully it's all about what you believe in. It's that's all it is. It's it what is. You believe can happen. Whatever you believe can happen is what's going to happen. So true. I think Henry Ford said that, right? Whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right either way. And I love that having a mentor in a way too is very helpful because sometimes it's just nice to have a framework. Otherwise you go down the rabbit hole. There's too many different opinions on the free stuff where one person says something's a great idea. Someone else's video says, ah, it doesn't even work. And now you're just kind of very confused. You know, a little bit about a lot. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety because you're not tied to one, you know, when you're in a game, like a football game with a coach, he calls the play. We're running that play and we're running at 110%. You know yes. what I mean? You know, now 
Was it the most popular caller? Would the other coach have called the same play? No, but it don't matter. This is the play we're running. Win. Stick to it. Find the goal line. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. So where can our listeners go to connect with you, to learn more, to get coached by you or join the programs that you offer on how to learn all this stuff? You know, you can go to um, 1000houses.com. If you go to 1000houses.com, you can go to that site and get so sick of Mitch Steven, it won't even be funny because I'm <laughs> everywhere over there. I, it's my blog, my podcast, my YouTube channel, my books, the information on the courses, tons of free stuff. Um, and believe me, if you ever want to call for a consult call about coaching or something, there's not any pressures. I'm trying to figure out if we're a good match. If we're a good match, I'll let you know that I think we're a good match. Then it's up to you because, frankly, if I can't help you, I don't even want to sign you up because I don't want to play on a losing team. Right. You know, I'll tell If I don't think you're ready, I'll tell you, and I'll give you some other plan. Maybe it's not the plan that you're calling about, but I'll tell you what I think. And if I can't help you, I'll throw my hat in the ring and go, look, I'm in. I know I can help you. So uh, now it's just up to you, but there's never any pressure. And, um, and uh, I'm not, I'm not in this just for the money. You have to charge people or I will not get what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone to like happened, you know, last month, someone drove to my house four and a half hours from their home to shake my hand and say, thank you. Give me a hug because without you, I would never have been able to fire my, my boss yesterday. And he's inspired my boss. And so, you know, that's what I'm in it for. The emotional reward of helping someone actually change their whole life and their whole perspective. And maybe by changing them, maybe their kids will have a different view when their kids grow up. And so it could be long reaching, could be far reaching, you know, but even if it's just the one guy, that's what I get out of it. The problem is if I don't charge any money, I can't sort through the takers and users to find the one that really wants it. So the right. the, the money's kind of the bar uh, that lets me know that someone's really serious. But I will not take the money if I don't 100% in my heart believe this guy's got what it takes and he's in a market and it's going to work. And I already know where I'm going to go to help him get his money back. Uh, you know, I don't want to be on a losing team. So if I don't think I can do it, I'll, I'll do something else or I'll, we'll talk about just getting on the weekly call or something lesser. You know what I mean? Until the business Good. proves to you that it's a business for you. Yeah. And you mentioned that earlier at a certain point, more money doesn't equate to more happiness. So you're getting the fulfillment from transforming people's lives and their family trees, and maybe they can have a better life. There has than- to be an emotional reason now for me to really want to play because you give me another yes. 20, 25, 30, 50,000, I didn't change nothing for me. Just a you drop know? in the bucket. Yeah. Yeah. Someone, someone, someone writes you a nice long letter or sends you a video or shows up at your front doorstep. That's different. Sincerely yeah. in tears to thank you about something that you, the help that you gave them. I, I can't, I can't buy that. You know what I mean? That's amazing. Well, Mitch, I really enjoyed our time together. I will be sure to link that up in the show notes. If anyone's interested, definitely book a time to talk with Mitch and see if you're a good fit. Make sure you're willing to do the work because he doesn't want to play on a losing team. No one does. And so make sure you're ready to invest in yourself and take the actions necessary. And Mitch, thank you once again for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, Chris, man. I appreciate you. And uh, I guess I think you're going to be coming on my podcast here a little later on. Later today, today this afternoon. Great. Yeah. So cool. So we'll get to meet each other's audiences. I appreciate you guys very much. 1000houses.com. More about me over there than you'll ever want to know. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Thank you, Mitch. Appreciate it.